after service. If you didn't bring anything, be there anyway. Chuck is down there frying fish right now. There's going to be more food than we can all eat, so we need you to be there. We need you to hang around, fellowship, have some fun, eat some fish. Amen. 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 There are going to be a few announcements, and I love these, but our Easter festival, April 16th from 1 to 4 p.m., Two things you can do. You can sign up to, to serve out in the, the foyer. Also, you can bring non-chocolate candy. We need a lot of candy to fill 4,000 eggs. So, so the idea here is we're, we're doing some advertising, and we're hoping to get 400 kids plus adults to this Easter event. Second thing we need, we're relaunching our kids' ministry. We need volunteers. Some of you signed up last week. Uh, if you're wondering if I'm talking to you, if you can hear my voice, I'm talking to you. So the sign-up sheet is also in the foyer for that. Um, there's going to be an information meeting on Thursday, the 31st of March at 6 p.m. for the Easter festival. So if you can be here for that, we're just going to kind of lay out what we're doing, where we need help, kind of the time frame we need you to be here. Let's pray and let's get into worship. Father, you are so, so good, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place today. You are needed in this place today. God, have your way with us, with our hearts, Lord. Free our minds from distractions. And turn them to you. Let our praises be music to your ears. We love you, Lord. We thank you just for the grace, the mercy in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I, I came without husband and child today. My daughter, Addie, is homesick, so you can lift her up in your prayer time. We have a world-famous singer going to lead us off today. <laughs> Yay, let's give her, give her some encouragement. Yes. <clears throat> and Becky Johnson promised to dance if we did the song, so we're, we're watching you. <laughs> Here we go. Let's stand and worship our Lord. Amen. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Jesus. Yes. 
You guys can be seated for a second. David, Autumn, bring this uh, miracle baby up here. So this is their first baby to dedicate, um, and it's also my first baby to dedicate, so um, uh, we couldn't be happier for it. Uh, Matthew nineteen thirteen to 14. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In presenting this child for dedication, you signify not only your faith in the Christian religion, but also your desire that he may early know and follow the will of God, may live and die as a Christian and may come into everlasting blessedness. In order to attain this holy end, it will be your duty as parents to teach him early the fear of the Lord, to watch over his education that he shall not be led astray, to direct his youthful mind to the holy scriptures and his feet to the sanctuary, to restrain him from evil associates and habits, and as much as in you lies to bring him up and in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Will you, Autumn and David, endeavor to do so by the help of God? If so, answer, I will. I now ask you, the congregation, will you commit yourself as the body of Christ to support and encourage these parents as they endeavor to fulfill their responsibilities to this child and to assist by nurturing his growth towards spiritual maturity? If you will, answer, I will. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we do here and now dedicate for us in the name of the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to anoint for us and we're going to pray one more time for him. Oh, a little sleeping head. Heavenly Father, we humbly pray that you will take this child into your loving care, abundantly enrich him with your heavenly grace, bring him safely through the perils of childhood, deliver him from the temptations of youth, lead him to a personal knowledge of Christ as Savior, help him to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all people, and to persevere therein unto the end. Uphold the parents with loving care, that with wise counsel and holy example, they may faithfully discharge their responsibilities both to this child and to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Let's give these folks a hand. Congratulate them. And Amy has a gift for you guys. And um, I know this is special for, for many of you because you've watched Autumn grow up. Um, and now you get to see her be her mother and a wife and the miracle that is baby for us. Amen. Let's let's worship our Lord. Thank you guys.
praise. The word halal, which means to praise joyously. And Yah is Yahweh. Jesus. Jesus.
hands to you. We raise our hallelujah to you. For you fight for us in those battles we know are not of man, but of spiritual places. And you fight for us in those spiritual places. We are overcomers. Amen.
song came out a little bit after, actually came out a little before I was saved. It's a great, great love song. We're going to sing it about him, and then we're going to sing it to him. You'll see the words change from his to your as we sing this. It's called His Love. Perfect for Baptism Sunday. He paid it all.
Amen. You may be seated. God is good. All right. At this time, I'm going to, a little change of plans, but I'm going to ask Larry Rice, Ken and Rita Bartels, and I'm missing someone here. Oh, toot toot, Julia St. Ives there, uh, to come up front. We had two more, but uh, Lori Hazelwood's out with a migraine today, and we'll do that in a, a week or two. All right, yeah, right there. So the membership class with all of these folks has been great. Um, Ken and Rita have been in this church for a while. Uh, they come from a Wesleyan background, so it made much, my job much easier. Uh, Larry Rice has history in the Nazarene church, and... Julie St. Ives is married to a Nazarene pastor. So, um, yeah, she is. <laughs> well, well, she was going to do this earlier, but she just wanted to make sure the marriage was going to work. So, um, <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the privileges and blessings that we have in community together in the Church of Jesus Christ are sacred and precious. There is in it such hallowed friendship, care, and counsel as cannot otherwise be known apart from the family of God. There is the godly care of pastors with the teaching of the word and the inspiration of corporate worship. And there is cooperation and service, accomplishing that which cannot otherwise be done. Today, we affirm again the doctrines and practices of the church. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that human beings are born in sin, that they need the work of forgiveness through Christ and new birth by the Holy Spirit, that subsequent to this, there is a deeper work of heart, cleansing or entire sanctification through the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and that to each of, and that to each of these works of grace, the Holy Spirit gives witness. We believe that our Lord will return, the dead shall be raised, and that all shall come to final judgment with its rewards and punishment. Today we, um, sorry. So I'm going to ask you for, do you heartily believe these truths? If so, answer, I do. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and do you believe that he saves you now? In response, say, I do by faith. Desiring to unite with the Church of the Nazarene, do you commit to love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, as expressed by the covenants of Christian character and conduct? Do you commit to the mission of God as expressed in the doctrine, fellowship, and work of the Church of the Nazarene? Will you support the teachings of the Church of the Nazarene and strive with God's help, to grow in your understanding and practice of the same in a way that enhances the witness of the church. We endeavor in every way to glorify God by a humble walk, godly conversation, and holy service, by devotedly giving of your resources, and by faithfully participating in the means of grace. Will you follow Jesus Christ all the days of your life, abstain from all evil, and seek earnestly to perfect holiness of heart and life in the fear of the Lord? In response, you'll say, I will. I welcome you to the Church of the Nazarene and the fellowship of this local congregation with its benefits and responsibilities. May the great head of the church bless you and keep you and enable you to be faithful in all good works, that your life and witness may be effective in the care for the poor and oppressed and in leading others to Christ. Let's give these folks a hand. So Julie was supposed to wear her uh, toot toot shirt today, and she chickened out. But um, uh, it, very cool. it, it would have. Um, all right, um, let's pray. We have our bulletins here. We have our prayer list. Uh, also, Judy Hall. 
is just not doing well this morning. She's dealing with a lot of pain, so we'll lift her up. But let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do lift up our sister Judy this morning. God, we pray right now in the name of Jesus for your presence in their home, Lord. God, we pray that you heal her of what causes her pain. Father, we know you want us to bring bold prayers with a big faith, God, and that's what we're doing this morning. Father, we lift up all of these on this prayer list and those that haven't shared them. There's so many, Lord. We lift up Karen's nephew, Nick, who's going through so much this morning. God, you are the great physician. We pray for you to do the work only you can do. God, we continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and Poland and wherever help is being done, God, that your presence may be just miraculously there. God, we're praying for a speedy end to this war. And God, a revival in the hearts of men and women in these countries. Father, we're praying for change in the heart of leadership in Russia. God, that you might bring people to your salvation and, bring, and, and just use them for your glory. Father, we need your presence in this service today, God. God, I pray for your anointing as I bring your word. Less of me and more of you. I pray for the hearts of everyone here. God, that your word may take root deeply within our hearts and that we might be changed today. Father, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I am really excited about today. Um, it's been a busy, busy week for me. Um, we did something. Oh, my, my sister and, and brother-in-law, her family were here this week. We went to Branson on Wednesday. Um, did a ropes course. I Well, they did a ropes course. I didn't. Uh, Amy did, and I didn't. So that's... Can I explain the dynamic of our marriage? Um, uh, and then Friday and Saturday we were gone and we, we met. So my lead pastor, Alan Bradley, when I was in North Dakota, now pastors in Indiana, and we met in St. Louis for the weekend and just had some good time with them. And uh, it's been a busy week, but God has blessed me through it. Um, but I'm excited about what's going on today, that we can celebrate what the Lord has been doing am among us in this body. We've all witnessed the movement of the Holy Spirit here these last three weeks for sure. Amen. He is moving in our midst, and it's a great time to be a part of New Life Church. Amen. To be able to dedicate baby forest is a blessing. It's a blessing for David and Autumn. It's a blessing for forest. It's a blessing for me. I just I love this part of the job, of the calling. And it's a blessing for you, the congregation to have a child, to, to partner with these parents and raise, and to be able to celebrate that today. Many of you have been praying for Autumn her whole life, or most of her life as she was in this church. You watched her grow up. This is special. We also welcome new members. Um, this is a work of the Holy Spirit. God's called these folks here to new life, and they've been obedient to the call. And today we're going to be baptizing two people, uh, here in a few weeks, we're going to be baptizing another. We're going to be baptizing another one on Easter Sunday. And, and here's what I want to tell you today. If you have not been baptized and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have made the commitment to follow Jesus, baptism is a matter of obedience. So what I'm going to ask you is to pray about and come see me about baptism. Oh, I'm excited. Um, the Lord is at work here. That's exciting, right? The, the Holy Spirit has just been present in our series, but we are continuing our, our series in Acts, and I've preached Acts before. Uh, we have friends here from North Dakota that have heard it, um, but last week's passage in Acts was encouraging. The believers prayed together in unity. The Holy Spirit moved in their community. They were such a close-knit group. They were so connected. What we read about last week was one of the purest expressions of the church we could ever see. They are so united in the mission. Let's look at the end of chapter 4 again. It won't be on the, on the screen. 
do give you this. So these are going to be our primary passages today. Acts 5, 1 to 11, James 4, 4 to 10, and Luke 6, 20 to 26. Acts 5 will be on the screen. The other two won't if you want to mark your Bibles. But chapter 4, verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So we're left with Joseph, who they nicknamed Barnabas, selling a field and bringing it, the proceeds to the apostles' feet. And this selfless act in chapter 4 really summed up how committed they were together as a church. And now we're going to move on to chapter 5. See, I didn't really want to preach chapter 5 today. I really wanted to preach something different. This isn't an easy passage to preach at any time. It's really not an easy passage of Scripture to preach on Celebration Sunday. Uh, and you'll see why. But I, I tried and I tried to convince myself that God was okay with me preaching something different. The truth is, He wasn't having it. And I feel like the Lord has just been telling me all week, Jason, you be obedient and I will do the work. So let me read this passage from chapter 5. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of, the, part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in. Not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At this moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So what I'm thinking is, this is the perfect time to pass an offering plate. <laughs> um, I'm kidding, um, kind of. Uh, but but I think I, I've, I've been thinking about all week, and when I read this passage, um, is that Luke, filled with the Holy Spirit, was a man of great integrity. Why do I say that? Because if if you hired Jason Holt to, to write a history of New Life Church, I'm not sure I would include a story like this. And listen, we have to respect him as a history, as a historian. He isn't writing a fairy tale about the figurative body of the church of, of, of Christ. He's telling a story of the actual church, and he does it with in, integrity. And this story is important for us today. Verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought, brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. After they saw the great generosity of Barnabas and how well he was respected, Ananias and Sapphira decided they, want, they wanted some of that very respect. Joseph got a nickname. He was called Barnabas, son of encouragement. Ananias wanted a nickname as well. He wants the same respect that is given to Barnabas. After all, he sold a piece of property and placed the money at the apostles' feet, right? 
It looks like a generous act of a couple in this first church, right? He sold a piece of property and gave some of the proceeds to the church. Here's what we need to know. The motives, the motives of these two men matter here. Joseph got the nickname Son of Encouragement because it fit him. We'll see later in Acts that he introduces Paul, who was the murderous Saul, to the circle of apostleship. He introduced them. Um, he is an encourager. He also brings Paul to the church in Antioch. He kind of facilitates Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. It is who he is. He is being obedient in his spiritual gift in the church. That's why he got the nickname. The, land, the, the selling of the property had not, nothing to do with it. It was just indicative of who he was at his core. He is someone that helps and encourages. On the other hand, we have Ananias and Sapphira. Just like Barnabas, they owned a field. They weren't forced to sell the field or give all the proceeds once the property was sold. Doing either was completely voluntary. So what is the problem? Ananias appear, apparently pretended to give more than he actually did. The Greek word used here, which means to misappropriate, is the same word that's used in Achan's story in, in uh the Achan story in Joshua, verse, chapter 7, verse 21, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it's only used one other time in the New Testament, in Titus 2.10, and it means to steal. So the story of Ananias is to the book of Acts, what the story of Achan is to the book of Joshua. In both narratives, an act of deceit interrupts the victorious progress of the people of God. Here's the thing about Ananias and Sapphira. They are spiritual posers. They wanted to be viewed as something they weren't. They wanted to project this public image, and on the inside, they were something completely different. They were after the praise of men, and that is a dangerous place to be, and they're about to find that out. They are hypocrites. Is anyone familiar with this word? It's bombs thrown at the church all day long, right? Have any of you ever been guilty of this? If you didn't raise your hand, you're a hypocrite and a liar. So, <laughs> But the thing is, prior to this, the only opposition that the church had faced was from outside the church. This, in chapter 5, was opposition from within the group. And understand this, this is so much more dangerous. So dangerous thing is, Satan will use opposition from outside the church, but he, I promise you, he prefers to use opposition from within the church. I have no fear of what the world can do to the church. None. Because you're fanning the flames, baby. But from within the church, what happens is you get one or two people that act one way here and a, a, another way somewhere else. And they slowly just kind of smother the oxygen out of the room and churches die. We've witnessed it, right? Hypocrisy will destroy you and it will destroy the church. Art of Zerdia in his commentary said it this way. A dangerous holiness is God's response to determined hypocrisy. Some of us are determined to be hypocrites. What can we learn from this? This is it's going to blow your minds. Don't be a hypocrite. That's easy, right? But it's not. Because inside of us, many of us want the praise of men. We want to look a certain way. We want a nickname. We want our name in the book. But for the wrong reasons. Verse 3, then Peter said, Ananias... How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? So God apparently gave Peter a supernatural knowledge of what Ananias had done. This spiritual gift called the word of knowledge in 1 Corinthians is, is just that. It's a spiritual gift. We all know Peter is full of the Spirit. We've read the first four chapters. But when Peter said this, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? He must have been crushed. 
You know why? He was expecting to be praised. Thank you, Ananias, for your generosity. But that's not what he got. Why has Satan filled your heart? He was expecting to be praised, but he was rebuked. He thought that he was on the fast track to leadership and was going to get the praise of men that he so desperately desired. Instead, he was exposed as a fraud. Then Peter says that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land. So we mistakenly read this passage, and we think the primary sin here is withholding the money. And that's not it. Peter addresses this in verse 4. Didn't it belong to you before you sold it? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Peter lied to the Holy Spirit. This is very serious. Listen to what James chapter 4 says. It's going to be James 4 verse 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think, Scripture says without reason, that he jealously longs for the spirit he caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why the Scripture says, God opposes, opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash, you, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. The Father longs to be with the spirit. Just like he longed to be with Jesus. This is part of him that he has given up for you and for me. And he longs for it. This part that he longs for, Ananias has grieved. He has grieved the spirit. He has lied to it. The Holy Spirit is a person that can be grieved. And that is exactly what Ananias does here. In, in verse 4, James says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You can't have it both ways. You can't be in a covenant relationship with Jesus or the bride for the groom and be dating the world. It doesn't work like that. You can't. Have it both ways. And that's what Ananias and Sapphira don't get. And it's something that's very hard for a lot of us to get. The desires of our heart versus the will of God. And they didn't get it. And this is what Jesus was talking about when he gave us the blessings and the woes in the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6. Let's look at what he says. And bear with me. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated false prophets. Ananias and Sapphira want to appear to be pious and devout, but secretly live life on their own terms. When you do this, you make yourself an enemy with God. Ananias and Sapphira wanted it both ways. They wanted their cake and they wanted to eat it too. Some of us do that as well, if we're honest. I've done it. We want to feel good about what we're doing and we want people to think well of us. And my greatest fear 
what causes me the most worry as your pastor is that you get everything your heart desires. That you gain the whole world and you lose your soul. Just hear me. Your motives matter so much more than your activities. The state of your heart. <sighs> and I'm closing. It's quick today. Therefore, we must run from pride and embrace humility. Ananias and Sapphira let the devil get into their hearts. They grieved the Holy Spirit and they died. They made themselves an enemy of God. I don't want anyone here to be separated from God. I don't want anyone to make themselves an enemy of God. This is why I preach repentance, obedience, and surrender every single week. This is why I would love, love to preach about puppy dogs and pigtails or something warm and fuzzy. And there are plenty of churches that do, but I can't. Because it's what keeps me up at night is you getting every desire of our hearts. I, I want to leave you with some good news, though. And back to James. Verse 5. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. That is grace. Even though he longs for the Spirit that he has caused to dwell in us, he gives us more grace. Do we realize the magnitude of that? No, we don't. Oh, man, we don't. He gives us more grace. He owes us nothing but gives us unmerited favor in our lives. Please, but please understand that this grace is not cheap. It cost him so much. It cost Jesus the death on the cross. It cost the Holy Spirit to be grieved. Many of you know grief. You've lost someone recently. You know what it is to be grieved. This grace that you and I get cost him so much. This grace is not cheap, but we make it cheap. It costs him so much. Please receive this grace today. It costs him so much, but he gives us more grace, as James said. You guys can play. God is on the side of the humble and opposes the proud and disobedient. The spirit of Ananias is alive and well in the church today. Good news is he gives us more grace. That is the good news. We could never earn this. Ananias and Sapphira did not receive this grace, but today we do. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We are going to receive communion today. This is a sacred moment, a sacred sacrament. And God requires that we examine our hearts before we do this. This is a means for, of grace. Today, I'm going to ask you to receive this grace. Before we do, though, I'm going to ask you, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. That is his promise. Purify your hearts of your double-mindedness. And this verse 9 is powerful. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. That is good news. To grieve and to mourn and to wail is to empty yourself and receive the Holy Spirit and be lifted up. 
He wants to do something in your lives today. The altars will be open this morning. They will always be open. And he wants to meet you here today. He wants to turn your grieving and your mourning and your wailing into joy in him and lift you up. This is the God that we serve. If you will resist the devil and turn to God, he will flee from you. The devil is on some of us. Some of us has not received that first work of grace. We have not received the grace of our salvation. Some of us have not made the decision to surrender and follow Jesus. To believe on his name for salvation. I want to invite you to do that today. Jesus Christ will change your life. Some of us need a work of the Holy Spirit. We need a baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to be sanctified to the Lord. I'm inviting you today to grieve and mourn and wail before the Lord and allow him to lift you up. You're getting a chance, Ananias and Sapphira didn't. Receive that grace today. So we're going to open up the altars. We're going to pray. We're not in a hurry. We're going to allow the Lord to do some surgery on the hearts of his sons and his daughters. And then we're going to take communion in the presence of the Lord. Father, you are so good, God. Holy Spirit, I'm just inviting you to move, Lord, to have your way to fill your children today, God, so they might go and live a life that honors you, that brings you glory, and that is for their good. The world is appealing, Lord, but I know once we've tasted how sweet you are, the work you do in our lives, God, there's no turning back. God, we pray that you turn your children into people that invite persecution to just fans of flames, God. I pray today before we take communion that we repent of the hypocrisy in our own hearts because we've all done it. We've all fallen short. You alone, God, are good enough. Jesus, you alone could atone for our sins. And we trust you. We thank you for that today. Father, have your way. Holy Spirit, move in this place today. In the name, in the powerful name of Jesus, the name above all names, we pray. Amen.
you if you have um, if you're ready to just come get your communion elements no rush at the altar stay as long as you need God is doing work and we don't want to interfere with that but when you feel led come get your communion elements and Anthony's going to lead us in communion um, Marie and Casey you can
on the night on the night in which he was betrayed he took bread gave thanks broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me Likewise, as the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to join here on a Sunday morning in a community on a Sunday where we celebrate being a community in your name, Lord, and a Sunday where not only have we dedicated a child into the life of the church, welcomed new members into a deeper relationship with you, Lord, but we've also partaken in communion in honor and reverence for the sacrifice you gave, Lord, that has washed us of our sins, that enables this relationship we can have with you, Lord, that changed our lives and our world in a way that we will never truly comprehend, but we are so grateful, Lord. And now we get as a community to participate and witness the baptism of two others, Lord, two people who have recognized the call in their life to take that next step, to take part in this sacrament, Lord, this deep, deep, meaningful part and step in a walk of faith where they're representing their souls being washed by the water, washed by the blood, Lord. And we thank you for this opportunity to come and be a witness to this, Lord. And I pray as we go forward into this next step that we do remember the words that Jason prayed today or preached today that this is not a life we can live double and this is not a life where we can where we can just pretend lord this is something as this baptism represents that is a deeper deeper calling so i pray as we move forward lord that we honor this call and we thank you again lord in your holy name we pray amen used to this handheld, so I'm going to do this, but, um, and that's much lower, but, so the first thing we're going to do, we're going to have father, son, I mean, oh, sorry, uh, mother, son, baptism is pretty special deal. First thing we're going to do is we're going to allow them to read their testimonies. I don't think she's going to make it, but, uh, uh, oh, father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Marie's going to read her testimony, and then I think Casey is going to do the same, and then we'll leave in the water, like their shirts say, right? We, we switched, because he wanted more, and I got more to cover than he does, so. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Not a public speaker. Uh, in fact, I talked to my sister earlier in the week and told her I was getting told her I was getting baptized. <laughs> yeah, don't know what I'm doing. And uh, she goes, "You're gonna give your testimony." And uh, I go, "I think I'm off the hook." Pastor Jason didn't didn't tell me, but uh, Thursday, Thursday. Um, so the last couple days been a lot of prayer. Um, so, my paper says to say good morning. I am, I'm, I'm so grateful for this day. I am, please be, bear with me. And I'm also supposed to only talk one to three minutes, but that ain't happening. It'll be a little longer. 
I am so grateful for this day. I am so grateful for God's love and grace. I am so grateful you are here to share this with me. I was trying to decide. I was trying to decide if I should write this out or just let the Holy Spirit speak. And I remembered a sermon Pastor Grant gave. And he said that we should always trust the Lord. But that doesn't mean that we aren't supposed to plan and prepare. So I decided to prepare. But if the Holy Spirit decides to speak, I'm handing over the microphone. So, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. All right, after a lot of prayer and overthinking and more prayer, I realize that my baptism today is my testimony. It's my testimony of God's perfect plan for my life. He knew my entire life that today was the day I was to be baptized. He meant for it to become my testimony. He planned for you to not only hear my testimony, but to witness it. The perfect plan. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Jason included in his sermon a call to baptism. Since I was never baptized, I know, I had planned to, I'd always planned to, uh, I felt it was time. So I spoke to Pastor Jason. Of course, he was curious as to why I was never baptized, so I explained. See, uh, my mother was not raised in the church, and she always felt insecure around religion, religious people, and situations. So she wanted me at least to have a basic understanding of religion and God. So she faithfully made me get up every Sunday morning, put on a dress, and then drove me the 10 plus miles to the only church in our little four stop sign town. I listened to the lessons, but I really didn't hear them. I really don't remember much about it at all. I did, however, learn the Lord's Prayer and the church gave me my first and only Bible at, at age nine and it's right here. It's the one y'all see me. That, that was the age that I was told that I was to be baptized. That day was October 7th, 1973. And I know that basically only because it's written in front of my Bible. But that wasn't God's plan for me. At the time, my mother felt that I wasn't old enough or prepared enough to make such an all-important all decision. So I didn't get baptized. Honestly, I can't even remember if I cared. My mother is a very wise and loving woman. And I never questioned her decision. It is part of what led me to this day. So it was the, it was the right decision. Like me, my mother's journey to Jesus took its time. But I'm happy to tell you, she is now quite comfortable in her church. And every time I say the Lord's Prayer, I think of her dragging me to Sunday school. And I am thankful. Okay, now just a little more background. Uh, there's only two pages here, so you're almost there. I'm taking pause because this is important. This is important to me and it's important to the Lord. 
I am, I am 58 years old. God called me in my early 20s. It was the only time of year that you might find me in church, Easter Sunday. I don't remember the exact year. I don't remember who I was with. I can't even tell you what church I was in. I remember, I remember the pastor prompting the unsaved to accept Jesus, just as all we've heard many times before. And then it just happened. I didn't ask to be called. I didn't expect to be called. But he called me. I can still picture that moment. It felt like what I can only describe as a direct connection to the Lord. And in my heart, without speaking a word, I said yes. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. No one knew except me and God. I left that day, and God never left my side. He was always there. But for the most part of my life, I didn't see him. I'm going to kind of skip over the next part, that part of my life that most times testimonies are made up of, the highs and the lows, the extreme joys, the unseemingly unbearable losses, the breathtaking beauty, the miracles, and eventually what I would come to know as the undeniable signs and wonders that God placed in my life because that is all testimony for another day. My testimony today is about today. You see, God has given me the most amazing gift today. He has given me the opportunity to fully appreciate the lifetime of gifts and grace that he has given me. He has patiently and lovingly brought me to this day, to this very moment. All of this so so I can love and worship him and honor him in a way that no nine-year-old heart could ever understand. What a gift. This is God's perfect plan. And uh, not only did he plan this day, he brought out he brought out the good wine. This week God arranged for my son to join me in baptism. <laughs> Nearly 50 years ago, God moved in my life in order to give me this exact day. He planned it all. He planned it perfectly in a way that only he could do. Dear Lord, may I always be joyful in hope patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Dear Lord, I hope this Easter Sunday you will call, the the church will be full, and you will call on all the unsaved souls, and everyone will answer yes in their hearts. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Got a little segue here. Uh, Casey? This is my son, Casey. Uh, This part, I'm going to kind of wing a little bit. But uh, we just found out within this last week that this is going to happen. God knew it, but we didn't. Uh, 
So I was trying to figure out, what can I give him? I need to give him something. And I'm looking on Amazon for Bibles and trying to figure out, what am I going to give him? And then, <laughs> cute. Uh, Tuesday happened, Tuesday Bible service. And I know this is an, this is an inside story, but uh, I left there thinking, am I supposed to give him my Bible? Am I supposed to give him my Bible? <laughs> to those that were there, I, I, I really don't want to. I'm going to pray about it. And so I did. And uh, yesterday morning, and Casey knows what this is. And uh, Kim does in a way. Kim, you started something big. Uh, I call this my prayer wheel now. So I was going through my prayer wheel yesterday morning. And uh, I realized this is what I need to give him. So, and I, I know the service is getting long, but this is God's word, and I'm going to read it. And I'm going to read it for a reason, because I'm giving this to you, Casey. And I'm going to read it to you. So when you read it, you're going to hear my voice. And you're going to know how much, very much I love you. So I'm going to read this to you and to you. So this is their Bible. It's God's word. I'm going to read it. I'm sorry. I think, I think Jason's realizing I got a little bossy streak in me. <laughs> but I'm 58, and I'm older than you, so. <laughs> so these are my, some of my favorite verses, and, and Kim inspired me to do this. And I, lo I love this thing. And I am going to print out another one for myself, but you're going to have this one. First, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. If my people who are called by his name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I put these in biblical order because that's how my brain works. So, My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You make known to me the path of life, and you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. The Lord is my strength and shield. I trust him with all my heart. He helps me, and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. Weeping may stay overnight, but there is joy in the morning. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in, in the earth. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And I know that full well. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. So if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in it the way everlasting. Show me the way I should go. For to you I entrust my life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. 
In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Whoever pursues righteousness and unfailing love will find life, righteousness, and honor. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. Let your light shine for all to see. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is for my sister. She, she, uh, we talk about memorizing Bible verses, and Cindy, this made me think of you. Love you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I'm getting there. I know there's a lot of them, but this is the Lord's word, so. <laughs> Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Your Father in heaven knows much better than you do how good thing how to give good things to his children. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest and very little is also dishonest and much. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And remind you of everything I have said to you. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain with me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And we know that all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. (laughs) 
if God is with us, who can ever be against us? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It kind of fits today. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. So whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Amen. It is for grace, it is for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. I love, I love this one. This is what I want to be. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient and bearing with one another in love. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Rejoice in the Lord always. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks. I love this one too, my fears. For God gave us his spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. That's a tough one. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. I'm almost there. I'm almost done. It's all good stuff, though. Amen? Amen. Every good and perfect gift is from above. If anyone among you is anyone among you in trouble, let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Where's Roxy? Love you, Roxy. <laughs> Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. This is Second Peter 1, 3 through 11. It's a long one, so you all have homework. <laughs> Do not love the world or the things in the world. You, dear children, are from God and overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Last one. 
Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I am so blessed in this day, and I, I thank you for your patience. Uh, I love you all so much. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not. I can't remember the last time I was in st on stage speaking in front of a bunch of people, <laughs> but uh, I just want to take a second to tell my parents how much I appreciate them and let them know that I wouldn't be half the man I am today if it wasn't for my upbringing, and I just want them to know that I'm very blessed for them both and I'm very appreciative. <laughs> um, my testimony is just a little bit shorter. <laughs> I've spent most of my life being a people pleaser, always striving to make every situation I'm a part of as pleasant as I can for all parties involved. I realize that isn't a terrible trait to have, but in many cases it's to my own detriment. Oops. <laughs> Wearing shackles of self-will and control, thinking I'm ambitious and intelligent enough to get what I want when I want it. I've come to learn that if I try controlling things I'm not meant to, not only do I fail, but struggle also to handle the things I'm meant to. I've gone through some really great times and have gone through some really hard times. I've never had much time in the middle, never had much peace. No matter what side of the spectrum, something was always missing, leaving me all the time empty. I'm I've only recently learned that the thing missing in me was God and our Savior Jesus, that nothing I or anybody could ever do to fill that hole like they could. Since I've been leaning into my faith, it's brought balance to my life that I've needed for so long. That hole isn't just filled, but is overflowing with patience, understanding, and most of all, peace. Don't get me wrong, I still worry and am at times fearful, but no matter what, I always find peace and take comfort in knowing it's the Lord's plan. I'm grateful to be a child of God, and I'm very excited to walk my journey with the Holy Spirit. Thank you. <laughs> Sweating. <laughs> All right, so we do, I thought you were going to steal my thunder for a minute with the Bible, but um, we do have a, a Bible here for, for Casey as our gift to you, so. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. Uh, Marie preached longer than I did, so I'll, uh, I'll go quick here. The Apostle Paul declares that all who are baptized into Christ Jesus are baptized into his death. We are buried with him through, the, through baptism so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too are raised to walk in newness of life. As we have been united with him in his death, we will also be united with him in his resurrection. That's good.
today recognize Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I do by faith. And will you agree to follow him all the days of your life? I will, I trust in God. Marie, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. I do by faith. And will you agree to follow him all the days of your life? I will with his help. <laughs> Casey, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So join us downstairs for our potluck. Um, Let's pray. Father, you are so good, God. We thank you for what you've done today. We thank you for these baptisms, this baby, these new members, Lord. Most of all, we thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. God, we want to just pray and ask you to bless this food and nourish our body. May your presence be in our fellowship and may our words be honoring to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.